I'm going to talk about um, coalescent models in genetics, which is the, the kind of main family of models that I work on. And the purpose of the project that I'm going to present was kind of a pilot study on whether some of the advances that are coming out of the kind of generic MCMC literature over the past, let's say, five years or so can be employed in this setting and whether there's any benefit to them. And well, we'll, we'll see that the answer turns out to be more or less yes. Um, but in order to get there, um, I'm going to take us through a couple of steps. So first of all, I'll, I'll briefly describe the coalescent model. I imagine there's a fair number of people in the audience who know what it is, but probably not everyone. So um, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on that. This is perhaps an embarrassing section to have in, in, in a talk in, in this particular workshop, but I'll, I'll briefly sort of tell you what sort of algorithm, what sort of MCMC algorithms in particular people have been using for coalescent models for the past 20 odd years, 25 years that these things have, have been done. Um, spoiler alert is that none of them scale particularly well, um, which is kind of the, the motivation for this talk as well in that there's, there's still an active search for, for something better. Then this is the kind of new process, um, the, the zigzag process, which sort of ha has features which makes it plausible that it might scale better than Metropolis Hastings, at least in some cases. And we'll see that it's not immediately implementable for something like a coalescent model, or indeed, generally speaking, models which have sort of discrete variables in them, which is quite typical in biology. And so my contribution really is to, to kind of spell out how you implement these things in settings where you have both continuous and discrete variables. And then finally, I'll show you some sort of simulation results which make my point for me that um, the scaling does appear to be better, at least in the sorts of simple cases that I've been able to check thus far. Okay, so what's the coalescent process? Um, it is a model for latent common ancestry for, among population genetic samples. So I'm imagining here a setting in which I'm sampling, in this instance, five DNA sequences from a population. They have some common ancestry and that common ancestry creates positive correlation in the patterns of sort of sequence diversity or, or mutation patterns that you see on these sequences. And the coalescent model it, it is a kind of, it, yeah, it, it's a tool for modeling that positive correlation by actually postulating a model for the latent ancestry. So how do you, how do you sort of generate this tree? Um, essentially, it comes about by assuming that each pair of individuals is merging at rate one. So I suppose this is the simplest way to look at this picture probably is to forget about the red dots for the time being. Suppose I'm actually generating a realization of the data. So the, these red dots are the eventual realization, but let's imagine I've not simulated them yet. How do I go about doing this? I merge each pair of lineages at rate one. That draws a random binary tree. So the first merger event happens to be here, second one happens to be here and so on. The fact that only adjacent individuals are merging on the slide is only for visual clarity. There's not supposed to be any sort of vertical structure on here. Uh, this is all, all fully mixing. When I reach the most recent common ancestor, so I only have one individual left, I stop simulating the tree. I have all the ancestral information that I need. Then I throw down some mutations as a Poisson process along the branches of the tree, and they get inherited downwards. So these two mutations correspond to the two which are sort of joint between these two sequences. This guy is that one, that one's that one, that one's that one. And that creates this pattern. So it's a generative model for synthetic DNA sequence data, if you will. Here then is the typical inference setting. So the biologists will come to you and they will say, we have the sequence data, but we have no way of actually observing the tree. Either you would have to go to the cemetery and exhume a bunch of people or, um, well, any, any other alternative really is probably even more impossible than that. Uh, often you just flat out do not have access to this data. Maybe may a couple of ancient fossils or something like that, but very few, very little information about what's gone on in the tree except through the pattern you can see in, in the sequences. And so the problem you end up solving is sort of briefly cartoon described in this equation here where I'm looking at a posterior distribution of day of my well I'm looking at the likelihood of my data given some latent parameters data being the DNA sequence data that I've actually been given and the only way I have access to this is as this sort of 
um, data augmentation scheme where I integrate over the space of latent ancestries and look at the probability of data given ancestry and parameters, probability of ancestry given parameters integrated over ancestries. And so this ends up amounting to a big um, integral over a space of binary trees. And it, it won't be a surprise to anyone, I'm sure, to hear that um, this integral can only be solved analytically in very trivial cases. Numerical methods start falling over when your sample size hits about 50 or so at, at, at the very top end. And so in practice, well, this is where I, I, I typically in the past have said that more or less the only, only tool you have to tackle this sort of likelihood function is some sort of Monte Carlo method. After the past day and a half, I suppose I, I should add that emulators also seem like a, a possible way forward. Even if you were dealing with an emulator, though, you would probably want to retain some sort of notion of the tree-ness in it, because quite frequently um, features of the latent tree are quantities of interest. So, for the purposes of this slide, you can forget about coalescence, you can forget about trees. This is purely a, an, an illustration of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which is the one of the, the workhorses of not only Bayesian statistics in general, but also applied to coalescence in particular. So. How do you sample a Markov chain with a given invariant distribution? Well, you start from some initial position, you iterate the following dynamics, you sample a perturbation from a proposal distribution Q with this famous Hastings ratio. You either accept or reject your perturbation and you progress your chain accordingly. Um, you can write down quite strong and, and quite general sort of performance guarantees for these types of algorithms. Um, though in practice their the scalability with dimension can, can cause issues. Um, maybe it's worth commenting briefly on how you sort of use these things for coalescent trees. If I flick back to my cartoon of a tree, the typical proposal kernel that you might consider would be something along the lines of break off a branch and reattach it somewhere else along the tree. It's those sorts of dynamics that you, um, you would iterate, possibly just scaling branch lengths without changing the topology, um, those sorts of things. And if you've heard of sort of algorithms, MR Bayes or Beast or these sorts of things, that's essentially what they're doing. It's clever versions of that, but it's still that 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 pretty much describes the state of the art. So, one of the reasons Metropolis Hastings is challenging uh, for not only for coalescence but also more generally is that it's inherently reversible. This sort of the, the whole point of the construction is that the Hastings ratio ensures you have detailed balance. Detailed balance means you're reversible with respect to your target distribution. That's how you know that that's the stationary distribution in the first place. Reversibility has a downside. It tends to make things behave like random walks. And so that means you tend to double back on yourself a lot. This is not a Metropolis Hastings simulation. This is just a random walk that I simulated. But the, the qualitative nature of the picture is the same. So if I'm at a position, I'm likely to stay there for a while. And at each instance, I'm having to perform a likelihood evaluation, which is probably expensive. And um, I'm not exploring the state space very efficiently. So it would be desirable to, instead of having this sort of backtracking for a bit before you go somewhere else, be able to move in a more kind of systematic fashion, explore your state space in, in a kind of velocity or momentum driven way, and um, only do these sorts of turn step, turn around steps when it's actually necessary, when the kind of target density tells you that that's what you ought to do. Um, that's what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo tries to do more or less, although it is still ultimately reversible. In, but um, the, the class of algorithms which has um, been introduced with the express purpose of being non-reversible, um, well, the, there's a few families now, but I'm going to be focusing on the zigzag process. So how does the zigzag process work? This is, again, a completely generic um, pseudocode description of the algorithm, nothing specific to trees yet. Um, but what I want to do is I still have my variables x, which I want to, uh, on which my target density is defined. And I augment my state space with velocities. So v is just a vector of velocities, which each coordinate of which takes the value minus 1 or plus 1, and tells me along that coordinate axis, which direction am I moving in at the moment? The algorithm pr progresses in continuous time. Um, and what these lines are doing is I have along each coordinate axis an event rate, lambda i, 
So these first few lines are simulating an ex exponential clocks of rate lambda i along each coordinate direction. Um, once I know when the first clock rings, I move my state variables at constant velocity v until that ring time, progressing my time variable as well, and then whichever clock rang, I flip the velocity along that coordinate axis. And if I choose my uh, flip rates correctly, namely in this fashion, then I can ensure that pi is a stationary distribution of this algorithm. <clears throat> You'll notice though that there's sort of an inherent continuity assumption in here. My variables had better be continuous, otherwise I don't really even know what taking a gradient of the log target even means in the first instance. And so if I want to apply this to something like a tree topology, then I, I, I need to start by making sense of what do I actually mean by the algorithm. So that's what we're going to do next. Yeah. No, we're not. Before that point, let me just show you a trajectory of this exact algorithm. This is, um, I've shamelessly lifted it from the paper by Joris, Paul and Gareth. Um, this is w what zigzag motion actually looks like in practice. They have a sort of S-shaped target density, which would be quite challenging for a metropolis algorithm to, to explore. For instance, if you were to adapt a metropolis algorithm to do well in this position, then your proposal kernel would probably have contours that sort of align with the, with the target density over here. And now if it happens that your state variable goes over here, well, your well-tuned metropolis uh, proposals are actually actively deleterious and you need to do something really quite clever indeed to get a metropolis algorithm that aligns well to the whole of this target distribution, whereas the zigzag dynamics are perfectly able to sort of make their way around corners and stick to these kind of narrow corridors along which the, the contours of the target density are defined. Okay, so here's where I, I'm going to try to make sense of a zigzag algorithm for a tree topology. Uh, well, I, so I have continuous variables that, that they may be static parameters and also branch lengths. So those are non-negative but otherwise continuous. And then I've also got the notion of tree topologies. So I'll start by focusing on just a diagram on your left of the screen, which is the simplest non-trivial case. Um, namely, I take a sample of size three. So I have three leaves and I want to understand how do I move around my space um, with a with zigzag-like dynamics and update both the branch lengths and the tree topology. So over here, I've constructed, well, let, let me describe the branch lengths first, I suppose. Um, I want to want to parameterize my branch lengths in the following way. I use as one continuous variable the first holding time, so the holding time between the time of the leaves and the first merger event. That will be the x-axis along this plot. And the y-axis is the time between the first event and the second event. So uh, there are three copies of this sort of positive orthant, each corresponding to a different tree topology. So there are three topologies for three leaves. I have three copies of my orthant. So each, each of these, each position along any one of these orthants describes a full realization of a tree. The topology being characterized by which of my three copies of the state space am I in, and the branch lengths by the x and the y coordinate along that place. And now you can begin to sort of see how, how zigzag dynamics might work here. If I start over here, I'm perfectly able to set up a velocity that goes, for instance, this way. Then I hit a boundary, and at the boundary, it <coughs> it turns out that my target density, the density arising out of this coalescent model, is not differentiable. Um, but actually, so if you um, pick up Davis's book on piecewise deterministic Markov processes, which is the, the right tool for studying and constructing zigzag algorithms, that turns out not to matter in this sort of case. At, at fixed boundaries, of whose presence you know a priori, there are things you can do, there are sort of non-differentiable jumps you can make in your algorithm. And in particular, the coalescent target density, it has a, it's not differentiable at the boundary, but it turns out to be continuous. And 
for that reason, it's actually fine to just arrive at the boundary and um, progress to one of the adjoining orthants uniformly at random. You can think of that almost as making a Metropolis Hastings proposal to leave this orthant and enter an adjoining one, which happens to be accepted with probability one because the target density is continuous. If it were discontinuous, then you may also occasionally randomly have to reflect back to where you came from. Um, that turns out to generalize in the paper. There's a fully generic description of how that works for discrete variables, which you model in this sort of boundary driven way. And the last point to make on this slide is that, okay, this is good for sample size three. What do I do for bigger samples? Well, basically I have to construct a bigger space. Um, <clears throat> so for a larger number of leaves, I need a higher dimensional positive orthant. Of course, I have more branch lengths to include, but also I need more orthants because I have many more tree topologies. However, it turns out that the kind of intersections between orthants remain really simple. So any particular combination of orthants you can model in exactly the sort of way over, as I've done over here, where only three orthants meet at a point. And so you can always make these transitions very easily. The, the number of intersecting orthants does not grow with the number of leaves. The only exception is you will occasionally have um, positions in the space which look like this. So here I'm imagining some big tree where I have um, locally th this type of event where sort of two locally independent coalescences change order. So as I sort of move along the trajectory here up towards the boundary, these two are getting more and more simultaneous at the boundary. They happen at exactly the same time, and then they've reversed order into the other one. That's the only other kind of boundary you end up obtaining. Um, this, I, I, I should credit um, um, Drummond and Gavrushkin, who are the people who actually wrote down and described what this space is. They call it the Tau space, and it's a way of embedding coalescent trees into, into a continuous metric space which has sort of nice geometric concepts and you can write down derivatives and so on. Okay, here's a um, diagram from their paper where they sort of were slightly braver than I was and tried to draw the tau space for four leaves. They didn't quite manage it. This is only one third of it. Uh, or the, Yes, so you, you would have sort of three bits like this merged together still, but the, the, the point remains that all of the kind of local intersections look the same as they did in the simpler case on the previous slide. Okay, uh, the remainder of the talk is essentially a simulation study where I plucked a data set from the 90s, which is simple enough that I can run Metropolis algorithms on it and be confident that it's converged reasonably well. Data set consists of 55 individuals. I think there's 18 segregating sites in there, so 18 mutations. It's been analyzed many, many times. Here's where it originally comes from and it's been looked at in a number of papers since. And these are just going to be trace plots from MCMC algorithms. So I sort of wrote a, a reasonably well-optimized Metropolis Hastings algorithm using the sort of ad hoc proposals that I described at the beginning of the talk, just for comparison, and then a zigzag algorithm on the other side. And, well, while I'm looking at the mutation rate, it seems like both of these are doing reasonably well. The zigzag's slightly faster, but that's sort of, I'm sure there are ways to engineer this algorithm in such a way that that, that will come down. This is the same sort of ballpark, so I wouldn't regard that as important. Um, if anything, the metropolis seems to be doing a slightly better job of exploring the tails. However, if I flip to actually looking at quantities related to the underlying latent tree rather than one of these scalar parameters, then the story reverses itself. So my, my zigzag is doing a better job of exploring the space of trees. Uh, while the metropolis is sort of beginning to show a little bit of autocorrelation in the trace plot. Um, in order to get a sense of the scaling, I simulated data from a sample that was 10 times bigger. So 550 sequences, same posterior mean mutation rate, ended up pr producing 38 segregating sites in this realization. And now the metropolis is beginning to struggle. It's still got this feature where it's sort of doing a better job of reaching states high in the tails, but this is really quite visibly autocorrelated. And if I flick to the tree picture again, you can see why that is. Uh, 
this has fallen over and died. This is not usable MCMC output. You would have to probably lengthen your run, the run of your chain by a factor of 100 before this was, this was useful. And at that point, the difference in runtimes really does start to matter. Um, last bit of uh, sort of scaling analysis. I went back to a sample of size 55, but increased the mutation rate by a factor of 10, which is to say it models increasing the length of the sequence you're looking at by a factor of 10. So now there's 250 odd segregating sites involved. And the story is sort of much the same, except we've got really quite a dramatic difference in runtime already. This chain is again fairly visibly autocorrelated, whereas the, the zigzag is doing a good job of mixing. And this, the same story is true of the tree height. I've just had a one minute mark, but this is also my final slide. Um, so yeah, take home messages, these zigzag algorithms and other non-reversible algorithms can be implemented more broadly than is evident in the sort of uh, general MCMC literature papers which initially introduced them. They're, they're surprisingly easy to do, in fact, in some cases. And um, they can do a very good job in improving the mixing and improving the scalability of algorithms in settings where Metropolis Hastings has traditionally struggled. Thank you for your attention. So that was brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you, Yuri. A uh, very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, did you also compare uh, with uh, HMC or some other sort of discrete time algorithm that are not uh, that a bit uh, that maybe exploit gradient information or? No, I didn't actually. Um, there's a, there's somewhat of a reason for that. Um, I promise I didn't plant the question, even though it turns out to be a convenient one. Um, so one nice aspect of these zigzag algorithms is that you are able to detect precisely when and where you hit a boundary. Um, there are adaptations of HMC for coalescent models, and they perform, they operate very similarly. The underlying idea is essentially the same. But one difficulty with them um, is that because you have to discretize the trajectory, you don't exactly know at which point you hit the boundary. And because things are non-differentiable or possibly even discontinuous here in terms of the target density, that results in a kind of excess of error. That can be handled, but it comes at quite a high computational cost. And you also have to work very hard to even prove that your algorithm has the correct stationary distribution. So um, yeah, the, there is an algorithm to which I could compare, and I probably should, but I haven't done it because there's a kind of reason to think that HMZ is quite awkward here um, in ways that these continuous time algorithms avoid entirely. Any other questions? And um, did you try different PDMPs? Uh, no. 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 I, uh, I coded this thing from scratch, and I didn't want to do any more of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so your experience is that it's, uh, it's actually tough to code. So what's? Um, it's essentially setting up the, the, the representation of this kind of state space and <laughs> debugging all of the transitions along it, which is, qu is quite a painful process. And I mean, this is still a, a, a simple toy model. 50 sequences with 18 SNPs is not interesting to, to modern biologists. So um, really to kind of operationalize this, y you would probably have to complicate the model further substantially. And getting all of the, so it, it, the usual issue with zigzag algorithms, getting all of the bounds on the gradients and so on in, in practice is quite a lot of work. Mm. Thanks. Um, yeah, just following up on the last point, I guess, given the difficulty of constructing this, do you think there's much value in, in making this um, sort of framework, um, particularly the likelihood valuation and the simulation from the underlying model, available as a kind of community resource um, that people could then easily compare lots of different algorithms on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, quite often, at least in, in my experience in these sorts of settings, the coding really has to be quite intrusive, it, as in it really has to go into the underlying model and 
it, the the features of the the kind of data structures on which you build your your simulator intimately depend on what the underlying model is otherwise you haven't got much hope of making it run at, at all in reasonable time um so I, I i think that would be a a colossal effort but a very valuable one if it could be done any other questions so I have one or two maybe. Mm -hmm. um, for your MCMC plots, did you ever look at like convergence diagnostics like R hat or similar things? Um, not particularly. I mean, you can sort of see what they would say. Yeah, right? yeah. That's converged. That isn't. Yeah. Um, so the, the, if, if you were running a, a, a wider battery of simulations or things like that, then of course you'd want a more automated way to check that mm. numerically. But um, I don't think they would add much to the kind of plots in, in the cases that I looked at here. And then finally, um, just with the kind of tau space idea, that's the first time I've come across that. Do you know if anyone's tried to do that for like clustering configurations? No, I don't. You don't? Okay. I'll take a look. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is, oh, another, yeah, another round of applause.